Evening, everybody. I'm Lydia. I'm the co-chair with Ashley for the AILA Healthcare Committee. And I just want to say welcome to our first event of 2022. Ashley and I are so excited to be kicking this year off and to be kicking this year off with some student presentations. We um, got to preview this briefly uh, last week, and we're really excited to uh, showcase these students and the future of design thinking. So we're going to start our presentations with Gaza. He's a fifth year architecture student at Cal Poly Pomona. And um, Gaza, if you could just give like a one minute intro to your project since Hofu's not here. And uh, Gaza is going to present for about 15 minutes. And then Ashley is going to administer a five minute Q&A after he presents. So warm welcome to Gaza. Go for it. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Gazi. And like I said, I'm a fifth year architecture student here at Cal Fi Pomona. I also serve as the president of the Architecture Honor Society known as Tau Sigma Delta. And I also work as a project design intern down here in Orange County for a small architecture firm. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, so for our healthcare studio, we did a project here at Cal Fi Pomona. We actually took a big uh, open lot and we decided to build a CPP Health Village on it. And that CPP Health Village on it has five different buildings, which is a ASC, Ambulatory Surgery Center, MOB, a medical office building, a cancer center, ancillary service center, and lastly, a small micro hospital. And also this project included uh, multiple outdoor areas for visitors, staff, and students, and around 400 parking stalls. Uh, so to get started, uh, my group did, a, uh, my, we did this project in, in teams of four students. So my group, uh, we called ourselves KGHR. Each group had to come up with a little firm name or just for the class. Uh, so this project was done by me, Rita Georgis, Kiara Kahina, and Hilary Kasuma. Me and Rita are fifth year students, and Kiara and Hilary are fourth year students. The great thing about our studio it combines fourth year and fourth year students together to collaborate and work on the same project. Uh, so to get started the project, when we first uh, opened up uh, the design issues about this uh, particular project, we thought about what a a village mean or what what is a community mean so as we're looking at researching different health villages or different villages in general we realize there's a lot of organic geometries and very open topography and also there is the idea of coming or creating community uh and in, in a sense there's a lot of uh circles or the, there's a lot of organic uh shapes or even pathways on this uh topography or different projects uh, so like I said, our project is located at Cal Fi Pomona. So you can see our campus right here is in the top left and our uh, site is pretty much right when you enter our school is at Temple of Valley Boulevard, which is uh, right when you enter. And the cool thing about our project, it invites the outside public into our site and also invites the students from the other side into our site too. And actually even Mount Stack is down this way too. So they invite them to, into our, our project. Uh, initially, when we first started, we looked at climate, we looked at wind, sun analysis, traffic, and even noise pollution. And from there, we took kind of designed our project and came up with a particular design that solved all these different issues. Uh, we also looked at, since we had five different buildings on our uh, site and different outdoor areas, we try, try to come up with different solutions or look, look at different examples to come up of uh, different ways how we could uh, create a similar language so that way our buildings are not so foreign to each other or so different from each other. And for this reason, we kind of use the facade system on all our buildings kind of to reduce heat gain and also create uh, a similar language that combines the entire project at, at one. Uh, so as we started developing the project, we took on our site and we kind of, like I said, we took on the circular shape. And we, from there, we kind of split up the circular shape into six uh, different geometries. And basically five of them became five buildings and the missing, the missing mass is pretty much the main boulevard that came into our project. And you kind of see here that the five different buildings and the first one, like I said, is the ASC and an MOB. The top one is a cancer center, then there's the ancillary service center, and lastly, a micro hospital. And they were placed in that particular order, uh, depending on the relationship and how the visitor could experience our site or depending on what building next, needs to be next to the other. And from there, you can see how we could develop our parking lot and also our outdoor areas, green areas. This is a site plan of our site. And here's a closer look of our site plan. And like I said, this is how it looks like. We took on the circular shape and pretty much 
uh, staff and visitors, uh, staff will enter from the north while the visitor will come enter from the south and there's a special entrance for, am, uh, for ambulances for the micro hospital. And uh, like I said, the main entrance is this central boulevard where you come in from Temple Avenue and pretty much each building has its individual drop-off area while some buildings share delivery or service delivery areas like you see in these guys over here. This is just an iBirds view of our project. And this is the main circle, the main entrance of our project. And you can see the five different buildings. And also it has a very uh, open outdoor areas for uh, the staff and also visitors. This is a side section of our project kind of shows the different heights of each building and uh, how it creates a relationship also to the outdoor design and the outdoor structures that we made. And we'll take a closer look at that throughout the presentation. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about the AFC, the Ambulatory Surgery Center. And like I said, um, like, like you see, uh, it has a very open uh, lobby that welcomes in all the visitors. In the in plan, what you see, uh, as we designed this building, we kind of created the lobby. Then you have all the uh, patient, uh, which is pre-operation, uh, pre post-operation area. This is where the, all the patients would come in first, and they will change, and they're taken into the surgery or procedure rooms, and from there, they're taken back. And once they're uh, good to go to leave, they can leave from the backside. Uh, while this side, the blue, is actually the staff areas and kind of separated for the privacy for all doctors and nurses. But there's also a central nurse station where the pre-op and post-operation is. Here, sections and elevations, it kind of shows you that main entrance, the very open lobby, and you can kind of see the section of different rooms and different spaces within this building. And this is kind of the axiometric floor plan, kind of explains what I'm, I was talking about. The staff uh, areas on one side, the surgery or procedure rooms are in the heart of the building. Then you have the pre-op slash post-op operations uh, areas on the other side. This is an axiometric of the building. Is the interior uh, view of the pre-op slash post-op area with the nurse stations. And here's some more renderings of the lobby and uh, the staff lounge in the back. Next, uh, the medical center, also known as the MOB medical office building. And pretty much this building uh, combines different exam rooms and provides different uh, services. And mainly it's just where patients come in to see different doctors. And for this reason, uh, as we designed this building, we took, on the we took on the exam room as a module. And from there, we kind of developed this grid uh, with interior courtyards. And we kind of, uh, uh, we, we left the quiet rooms, which is the doctor rooms on the corners of each building. So you can see as a doctor, let's say the doctor needs to serve these rooms, they could work on this quiet area or they need to uh, work on these exam rooms, they could uh, have their work area in this dedicated uh, place. And the back of the house is in orange. And like I said, the cool thing about this building, there is uh, outdoor or uh, natural light coming into these rooms. And there's this kind of small vegetated uh, wall that we created between uh, the rooms. So that way it kind of creates privacy so that way you know, patients are not overlooking different uh, exam rooms as they're visiting. Here's some elevation and section. You can see the courtyards I was talking about and you can see all the exam rooms. They have a view toward the outside and there's also natural light coming in. And the wood facade is very noticeable here on this building too, as we use it throughout the entire project. And here is an example of the uh, exometric plan. And you can see how the uh, patients would come in into the lobby, then they're taken back to an exam room while the staff are entering from the backside. Is an interior view of the courtyard of the nurse station. Also, the staff have a natural light. And next, we're moving on to the cancer center, which is that very top building. And the main reason that cancer center was placed over there, that way the infusion room, the infusion room or the patient room, uh, as they're receiving treatment for a long amount, for a good amount of time, uh, they have a view toward the back uh, courtyards that we created in the backside. And for this diagram, kind of explains all the negative mass that we took off from took off from this building, and to create also interior courtyards. In plan, you can see how the different this building split to almost four areas. You have the staff, and you have the back of the house on one side. Then you kind of have the patient uh, area or the exam rooms up up north. And here's the upper level of this uh, building, and you can see the same thing that's happening. And you can also see the interior courtyards that continue uh, down below. Here's some section elevation, and you can see the interior courtyards and different spaces, and also very welcoming lobby, double height space entrance to welcome in all the visitors. Just a diagram explaining where the patient come in and where the staff come in. 
And here's the upper level, also similar circulation. Here's some uh, interior render of the infusion room as it has a, a, a looks on the outside courtyards. And this is the bottom render is the lobby. And lastly, we're gonna take a look at the micro hospital. The micro hospital uh, provides uh, exam and patient rooms on one side. It also has an emergency department where the ambulance comes through. And pretty much in the middle of this uh, building, you have all the staff areas, the doctor, where the doctors work and the nurses. Okay, just section elevation, you kind of see also similar to the ASC, the ambulatory surgery center also has this kind of very welcoming entrance lobby and it kind of splits uh, the different departments on each side. Here are just uh, renders of the nurse station and you kind of see how there's a glass roof to provide natural light to come into the building. And here's just some more renders of the building and connections to the other building. And here's an axiometric of the building. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the exterior courtyard. So the exterior courtyard is pretty was important. So there's courtyards between the buildings, the courtyards toward the south and toward the north. And these courtyards are all dedicated for visitors, staff, and students, and even uh, visitors outside outside of campus. And for the reason we kind of created these areas, especially because in that particular corner of the site or that particular intersection, there isn't that many open green areas for visitors or even students to hang out out. So we kind of created all these uh, natural gardens for students, or like I said, staff uh, to eat, to just to hang out, to chit chat, or even just for staff to take a break. And these are just some renders of the outside as you come into the site. And lastly, we'll watch a YouTube video about our um, project. Just share sound. Okay. Please like, I can't hear it. Well, thank you everyone. That was it. All right, thank you so much, Ghazi. Very time efficient and <laughs> fit a lot into a little bit of time. Uh, so we actually have extra time for Q and A. We're gonna do it how we typically do. Um, feel free to unmute and just shout it out or you can put it into the chat and then um, we'll go in order on the chat and ask people to unmute and directly ask Ghazi your questions. So um, while we wait for people to start rolling in on that, I, I did have a, a question. I mean, the project was amazing detail wise, but I think it's really interesting having the group aspect to it. And so I was wondering 
what you found most challenging in that, what you found most beneficial, because um, I think that's something really helpful that you could take with working at a firm later. Yeah, so one of the most actually important things that I got out of this class was working in a group, uh, especially that I know as you work in an office, you're always working with somebody. It's rarely that you work by yourself. Uh, so one of the things that we kind of came up with at the beginning, kind of to come up to reach a compromise, how our design is going to take shape and how our building is going to take shape, especially that, especially when each student is designing their own building on a site that combines all uh, five buildings together. And we, as we're Coming up floor plan, section elevations, we kind of gave each other feedback. And, and in the back of the head, we always kept the idea of that we, all, we always had to keep a similar design strategy and similar idea so that way our buildings don't seem so foreign to each other. Thank you. And uh, Gary, I see your question. Would you mind asking that? Yeah, sure. Because uh, I had noticed on your campus, the cancer center is two levels, two floors, and everything else was one level. Was that part of the design requirements for the project? I was just curious about that. Yes, yeah, so it was actually part of the design requirements. The cancer center was the biggest building on, on, on the village, so it had to be uh, two levels, and each level served. They served similar purposes, but it was, it was one of the requirements to have two levels for that building. Thank you. Um, I've got a question, Ghazi, and I'll be the nerd to get into the nitty gritty technical of school versus real life, but the concept of a micro hospital is fascinating to me. And I was just wondering, and it could be more of a question for Hofu, but how were you, like, what was the program for that? Was it based off of what we're subject to in, here in California? Like, did it have to have certain things to it? Or was it just come up with things that would be in a in what in what you envisioned as a scaled down hospital so for the micro hospital we were given a program and the way we envisioned that micro hospital is pretty much a hospital but at a very very small scale and it had an emergency department so it's it served patients that had an emergency but at the same time it had patient exam rooms uh, for kind of just uh, for any patients that are coming in to see a doctor or maybe like an urgent care in that sense. And these two departments were split up by having the, all the staff rooms in the, in the middle of the building. So were there, were there patient rooms for like people to stay overnight or was it really not envisioned for like overnight care? No, no, we didn't envision, envision as overnight care. That way, one of the reasons is uh, kind of going into Osh, well, now they're known as HKI, but it was yeah. going to Oshpa two or three because the patients are not staying overnight. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I see we have have a question. question from Hugh. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Okay. Um, so Ghazi, the, the, this looks, um, you know, it's a very complicated project. Um, the, from the programmatic uh, functionality criteria in terms of the flow adjacencies, the operational side of each of these buildings, is that something that was given to you? Did you have a program to start with or is that something you researched at Young? Uh, this is one thing we researched on our own. Uh, so we were just giving the entire plot of land and we were told, design it the best way you think it should be designed. And for this reason, some other groups, they decided to split up their buildings and they have different buildings in different corners and each building had their own par uh, parking lot and they were all super divided. And other buildings decided to combine these four or five buildings into one building, like a four-story or five-story tower. Uh, for us, we decided to give each, each building our, its own character, uh, by the same time keeping it together or close to each other. So that way, uh, visitors don't have uh, to feel so like foreign or they have to walk the long distance to get to another building. For example, if you're in the MOB and you need to get an imaging or an MRI, so you just walk over to ancillary services, uh, which is like 50 feet or maybe not even like a less a 30 second walk instead of having walking like a five minute walk across the other side of the land. So you research the actual like each of the pods that you developed, you actually research the functional needs of each of those and how they related to each other. Yes. So in, 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 at the beginning, we actually did individual case studies. So I'm me, myself, I did the MOB uh, and I looked up MOB, different MOB case studies and each student had their own case study based on the building they were designing. And from there, we kind of brought our ideas together into a single concept board and how we that's how we learned about all our buildings. And we realized that maybe we should they, this is the way they should be placed or they should be uh, programmed. 
Great. Sounds great. Thank All you. right. I think we have, um, I see we have two more questions. So that's where we're going to stop for now. There is going to be time at the end. Uh, so Hugh, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I, I love the project. I love the site work. I think it's terrific. On the on the MOB, I just have a picky question because I love the fact that you introduced the exterior into the building. I think that's terrific. And I like it because I'm always frustrated by the fact that clients almost never let me do that. But one question as to your choice of where to do that. You, you, you did it on the inside next to the exam room windows. And those are often the windows that are always closed. And hopefully that's where the, the patients spend the least amount of time. I'm wondering if, if you looked at the alternative of, of introducing it into the interior circulation spaces where possibly more people would experience that space. Again, I, I think the introduction of the exterior is wonderful, but I'm just wondering if you missed an opportunity there. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so actually during our reviews, this is one of the things that was mentioned. And I realized that maybe having the outside uh, courtyards are kind of part of the corridors instead of implementing them just for the exam room, especially where uh, half of the time patients are not in there, patients are, or even staff are just circulating in the corridors. Uh, so you're kind of right, it may, it'll make more sense. But the, the initial idea for me was as visitors that come in, they don't have to feel uh, so uh, like, uh, how do I say it? Almost like in a, in a just in a box where there's no windows or there's no natural yeah. light coming in. So especially if you're like you're sick or you're just worried about what kind of sickness illness you have, you kind of feel a lot more yeah. comfortable to see you have natural light or even green greenery. Yeah, no, I could see it as a toss up. But mm -hmm. thanks. And then William, you want to ask your question? Oh uh, yes, hey, um, well organized project. It's uh, really clear how each element. Um, you know, by using the circle, you can sort of always stay oriented. Uh, and I was just curious, I, that is definitely a, a vehicular path, the circle, but um, was your intent also that that be the main pedestrian path, that main circle in the middle? Or were you thinking it was sort of like you have different paths for pedestrians to, to meander through the campus? Yeah, so, well, th there is a central path that comes in from the central boulevard, but also there's also a pedestrian path between those buildings. Uh, so you don't have to go around the circle just to get to one side, the other side, so you could actually cut through the circle uh, as pedestrians or even as staff walking through the campus. All right, thank you guys. Um, great presentation again, a strong start. So we are going to have these short little Q&A for each of the students, and then we'll have time at the end if anyone wants to stay on and ask any more questions. So with that, we're going to have Bauchi next. Are you ready, Bauchi? Yes, I'm ready to go. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Bauchi. Um, I'm fifth year at USC. Um, this is my last semester at uh, USC architecture program. And I'm happy today I'm share, gonna share uh, the studio project from last semester um, to you, all of you. Um, so uh, we're gonna start with some general uh, project overviews first, and then we'll jump into the uh, individual buildings to into, uh, introduce the design features. Um, that said, um, first I want to introduce the site. Uh, our site is just south of uh, Los, downtown Los Angeles, and it is sandwiched between uh, Thomas Jefferson High School and Snyder Recreation Area, uh, which is, are the two kind of major camp, uh, campus in the neighborhoods. At the south side of the site, uh, we have a row of uh, commercial buildings along the 41st Street. And other than that, um, uh, most of the other buildings are single family, uh, residential homes. Um, the main concept for this complex is um, we're designing a neighborhood oriented, uh, oriented uh, mixed use project for aging citizens to live in uh, a relatively pleasant environments uh, until the end of their lives. Um, so to achieve that, there are four major components uh, to, to provide that facilities. One of the most important one is the lifelong housing. Um, the concept of live on housing is originated in the in Europe. Um, compared to the um, conventional nursing home model, lifelong housing will be able to provide a much more 
um, independent lifestyle for these aging people until the end of their life. Uh, at the same time, the, the design of it um, preserve the capability of delivering home care service to the residents. Um, dementia housing a little bit is a little bit unique uh, because some of the aging people are starting to uh, suffer from uh, severe memory loss, make, which making them um, less um, can less independently living. So they need special care in the dementia housing clusters. And finally, the neighborhood commercial and outpatient clinics are the two components that support the residents that are living on site. And also these two components will also provide uh, support value for the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, during the site research, I identified a couple of uh, important um, site features, which including fence, um, grassland along, along the streets, and also some beautiful walking paths. Um, so based on that, I think um, um, the general concept of the therapeutic experience here should be included with a feature of a, a sense of protection. Um, and this experience should be achieved by uh, the building massing placement. So let's look at that. Um, the massing placement of this building, um, I intentionally put wrap around a string of building, which is um, comply with the program area requirements around the site. And that divides the site green space into two portions, a peripheral green space and a protected garden space in the middle. The protected garden space open up to the park site. So this space technically is more integrated to um, the recreation area. And to connect the, the two divided green space, um, there are a series of network that penetrate the building massing to connect them together. And on top of that, um, on the upper floor massings, um, there are volumes that is cut away to form some wheel, por wheel portals. So um, um, to make a visual connection to the border um, uh, context elements in the, in the region. And this is the overview of our complex. Um, each site is characterized, uh, each walking path is characterized um, by the site element it's passing through. So as we can see here, for example, this walking path, um, it's passing through a farmer's market at the clinic lobby and the drop-up area. So you can expect uh, a pretty um, vivid urban uh, experience around this path versus the path below adjacent to the park. Um, it should be much more quiet, but you can see a lot of exercising activities and kids playing around because it's right next to the park. Same to the, to the other access path. So from the ground level, um, we can actually see through the buildings from the, from the urban side, we can actually see through the buildings um, towards the Oasis Garden in the middle. And this kind of condition is uh, you, can, you can find it in several locations around the site and they're all characterized um, in a different way. And we have 140 parking space underground as a wayfinding elements. Um, I designed two sunken garden to let naturalized in so people can find their way to access um, the, the protected garden in the middle. And additionally, two drop off area for the clinic and um, the lifelong housing. The outpatient clinic is located along the 41st street. Uh, we make it the most visible because uh, this housing, this contain the program that is have the most value for both the neighborhoods and the residents on site. Um, among that, um, the lobby is the most significant access point. Um, stretch, the, the stretching from both sides of the lobby, there is the commercial program, um, including uh, retail, pharmacy, uh, uh, the pharmacy, um, and also education center and the exercising center. And these programs can all able to function individually without um, affecting the clinic operation. And I want to emphasize that this large clinic lobby is uh, featured as a natural ventilated space. So um, be able, so we're able to create uh, this kind of um, feeling that indoor-outdoor feeling in this lobby. And the actual clinic program is houses um, on, uh, on the second floor and the third floor. The lifelong housing is placed um, 
uh, along Compton Avenue, which is much more quieter than the 41st Street. Um, so the first floor is, uh, is um, pretty much uh, have experience like uh, Residence Plaza. Um, this space is echoing on uh, by the massings on both sides. The left side is a restaurant and the adult daycare center. And on the right side is a, a common, um, shared common space for the residents. And the social aspect for the aging people is, is uh, very important. It helps keeping them mentally healthy. Um, so um, this atrium is specially designed in, on, with this purpose in mind. Um, you can see here each unit have a front porch which accentuated by a wood material and in front of it there is a planter. These two elements can be uh, completely customized by the residents. So um, you can imagine walking inside this atrium, you can see every unit is, have uh, kind of expressed the personality of the people living inside. And also the extra space here can allow the neighbors to kind of stop by and chat with uh, the resident living inside the unit. Um, as we can see, the front porch is, is exists in the different units, and the size of it is actually um, pr uh, creating different kind of personality to the units, like introversive and extroversive. Um, the open living room concept um, of the two bedroom units um, can also like directly let the resident the neighbors to come in and kind of uh, get together and chat with each other during the daytime. Um, we have a total of four terrace garden, which is the carpet away volume from the housing, uh, housing uh, building. And they are all related to a different uh, uh, context elements um, around the site. The dementia housing is located at the most quiet corner of the site and it's a single story building. Um, the design of it, um, I have I put a lot of uh, uh, focus on making it uh, efficient. Um, so we can see this layout first conceptually, it's consistent with the lifelong housing. We have a common space in the middle and sandwiched by a two row of housing units and subspace. And also one of the convenience here is um, we actually get rid of the use of a, a hallway. So the sub member can be can serve um, this this residence uh, more efficiently, and we have a total of two cluster independent operating clusters in this building, and the, they share uh, one single garden in the middle. And because the common space is um, sandwiched in the middle of the units, um, so um, we I design an extra. Um, ceiling space to let natural lights in, um, and also this uh, large curtain wall feature is, is consistent with the clinic and housing building to provide a uh, much uh, better connection between indoor and outdoor. Um, the building elevation design is influenced by the Thomas Jefferson High School across the streets. Um, it is a streamlined modern style building, so that pretty much set up the architecture language as um, to Express the horizontalness um, of the uh, of the form elements. Um, there are two main type of facade elements um, um, to uh, coordinate with the space inside. For the public naturally ventilated space, we have uh, uh, transparent curtain walls with glass bullions. And for the mechanical uh, uh, condition space, we have a, a combination of storefront curtain walls and the and the solar shading system. Um, the shading system is uh, custom designed um, based on the, the direction of the facade. For example, the south side, we have this shading system to filter out the, the uh, high angle sunlight. And when, when the facade turned the corner to east and west, um, this uh, facade, this shading system dropped down 45 degrees to filter out the low angle sunlight. And finally, um, for the for the north facing um, facade, um, the shading system, be, uh, the shading become really Thin, so we can actually let in more ambient natural light to the north facing rooms. The housing uh, works a little bit different, um, but the main idea of expressing horizontalness is, the, is still here. I'm using the cantilever walkways and also the balconies to express that horizontal lines. And when we zoom in, um, we can see a little more detail. Um, for example, the the railing and the metal cladding to express that horizontal language for the entire building. 
And finally, this is the Oasis Garden. It is the destination of all the landscape access path. Um, this Oasis Garden is, consists of two portions. Um, the outside ring is much more active and the inside island is designated as a quiet therapeutic garden. Um, it's separated by the Zen River, which I'm gonna introduce in the next slide. Um, so it, in order to make that therapeutic um, environment, um, I'm taking inspiration from the Zen, um, Zen Garden. So you can see um, this river is actually composed with sand and um, we're gonna put some water ripple patterns on the top of it. Um, and the usage of planting is for separation between the active zone and the quiet zone. When people want to access the center, center island, they, they're going to cross the bridge and access the quiet oasis in the middle. And that's pretty much the project. Um, question and comments, welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bauchi. It's a beautiful presentation. So just as we did for the other presentations, uh, we're gonna have our five minutes of Q&A. Um, so feel free to type it in the chat and I'll call you out or feel free to unmute and go for it. I see, oh, Cheryl's commenting, beautiful project. <laughs> Well, I have one just to kick us off. Um, I just, I took a moment to just look at this area in Google Maps and it looks like it's generally a low rise area. So I was wondering, how did you come up with the general heights, especially of your like largest building um, in relationship to your to your neighborhood that's generally more of like a low, a low rise neighborhood? Yes. Um, so talking about this question, um, the height of the build, the, this, this, um, so the, uh, this is a lifelong housing building, so um, we we need to balance the two uh, two uh, two sides of this uh, problem. The first side uh, we have um, a quite a large of uh, requirements of the units. We have a total of uh, sixty five housing units, and also to in order to provide efficient home care service, um, the hallway should uh, should not be too long. Um, so that's pretty much um, set up the buildings cannot be a long bar type building or a large um, courtyard type building. Um, but what I can do here for the massing is to kind of, uh, uh, to create different height, um, height portion. So you can see um, the, the, portion, the portion that is adjacent to the street is much more lower uh, versus the one in the middle is much, much more higher. So I'm using this kind of a, a massing strategy to minimize the impact of uh, of the neighbor of the neighborhoods while uh, satisfying the programmatic uh, requirements. Nice, thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I thought maybe I might just mention a few things about the apartment for life idea and about she also. Um, uh, uh, explained why the density was important here, but we 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 really wanted uh, this to work uh, for a, as a home care delivery model, uh, which is uh, something that is very common in Europe, where people do not go to a nursing home uh, unless they have memory care uh, problems or difficulties. They they can age in place in this building until they die, and that's the big idea behind it. It's uh, been around for 20 years uh, in uh, mostly in northern Europe. And so they took this model as the basis for thinking about it and also uh, were interested in the idea of how to introduce density uh, into um, uh, these settings. And, and uh, that was part of the challenge as well. How, how do you do that in a way that uh, allows the building itself not to intrude uh, on the surrounding neighborhood? And I think Bauchi did a really good job, he described it already, of how he made those decisions. Yeah, wonderful. Deidre, you've posed a question you want to answer, uh, ask it. Um, I'll, Deidre, I'll go ahead and ask it for you if you can't unmute. Um, Deidre said, agreed, beautiful project and the materials make the space feel very bright. Often I see a more traditional materials and spaces for aging and I'm wondering how you settled on your materiality. Yeah. Um, interesting question. So um, 
Yes. Um, so the consideration behind this is that um, um, it's actually influenced by the building right across the streets. So you can, um, if we go back to the photos of the Thomas Jefferson High School, I think this is one of like a, a very iconic building on the sites uh, in the neighborhoods. So what I'm thinking for our, our mixed use uh, development it is, it will be uh, another iconic development um, to bring in, brought in in the neighborhoods. Um, so that's why um, we do a little bit, uh, we, for material wise, we actually go to the, uh, a little bit to the spectac spectacular approach. Um, and I'm also I'm hoping this um, material can express a little bit of high tech and being like, um, have that, that kind of high tech feeling to give, give the residents the best um, healthcare um, service as, as uh, they can. And hold that, ask that question, uh, answer the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I think we need to keep moving forward as we're inching on. So um, I see Suzanne asked a question uh, regarding the, if we consider the narrative for the project and the cross-generational aspect of the high school across the street, some of the European and Canadian models try to improve housing for elderly to have younger generations integrated into that model. Um, so was that a consideration? Yeah, that is a really interesting thought. Um, I think about it at the, right at the beginning of the, the project because, um, and, because and, and because both side both uh, both side of this site um, the park and the high school is is have a lot of kids um, so um, but that there's not actually no like actually requirements in the program um, uh, for this project um, so there's actually um, no actual integration about these thoughts in this project yet um, but I can imagine the kids can still use the therapeutic gardens. Um, on the ground level while the, the old aging people upstairs can come down and act, kind of interact with them or just um, looking at the kids um, playing footballs in the park. Um, that's probably part of the uh, consideration of the, of the terrace garden in the lifelong housing. Wonderful, thank you Bauchi. And just as a reminder to everybody, we will have some more Q and A time at the end. Yes. So. Um, thank you so much, Bauchi, for your presentation. It's a beautiful project. Um, next, we're going to move on to our two interior architecture students from Woodbury University. I'd like to give their professor, Professor Laura Hode, a minute to just introduce the project. Um, because we have two students presenting, um, Katie and Nalina are going to present for about seven to eight minutes each, and then we'll do a combined Q&A after both of their presentations. So Laura, I'll pass it over to you to just intro the brief of what their project was. Thank you, Lydia. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lara Hode. I'm an architect, interior designer, and the adjunct professor at Woodbury School of Architecture and Interior Design Department. Um, in fall 21, I taught the comprehensive studio on wellbeing, and we addressed the 2022 IIDA competition for the design of uh, the Cleveland Behavioral Clinic for outpatients aged two to 18 experiencing substance abuse and mood and anxiety disorders. Uh, the existing building is 11,500 square foot, first floor of a multi-story building uh, with a small outside space. And they were giving a, a complex program consisting of spaces for patients, uh, caregivers and administrators. Um, at the beginning of the semester, the students were given a piece of music composed by Devandra Barnhart and Noah Georgeson, which was accompanied by poetry and images and part of an installation at the in August 21. The music was created in response to feelings of isolation experienced during the pandemic, and the students, students were inspired by this music to create two and three dimensional studies, which they use as a springboard for their competition projects. In addition, prior to the competition, the students studied a series of different therapies that are used to uh, treat depression and anxiety, including, for example, music, play, and light therapy. And these were explored in a small spa design project. Um, the class consulted a psychology professor, Mercedes Hoffman, and had a guest lecture from Jinsara Ruth, who runs the Healthy Materials Lab at Parsons School of Design. 
Uh, they also, in conjunction with um, studio, the Wellbeing Studio, were studying for the Well AP exam. Um, so the two projects you're going to see today are quite different interpretations of the same brief, uh, which were very reflective of many of these kind of early studies and projects that we did before um, addressing the competition brief. So I'm going to hand it over to Katie and Nalina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're actually going to have Katie present first. So Katie, if you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, since COVID-19, it has become evident that mental health of individuals has taken a toll. Um, stressors like the pandemic have led to so social isolation, depression, anxiety, um, substance abuse, and overall just uncertainty in the world. Um, these unusual circumstances have allowed people to become more vulnerable with their mental state and to seek help. Although that it has been great to see people reach out and get help, um, and open up to therapy, these clinics have now been faced with a need to expand and um, to evolve a bit. So um, I, des I designed Zephyr Behavioral Health Clinic, and this focuses on patients ages 2 to 18 experiencing substance abuse and mood disorders. And like Laura mentioned, we listened to an instrumental piece of music that was created during the pandemic. And with this, I gathered a sense of peace, calmness, growth, and movement. I related to this piece because it reminded me of sounds that I would listen to to um, put my mind at ease. Um, this inspired me to use sound as a form of therapy in this health clinic. Um, there are, are a lot of natural sounds that occur in nature, like uh, trees blowing, rain falling, waves crashing. So in addition to music therapy, this health clinic will also provide art therapy. Let me zoom in. So oh, when looking at nature, I pulled out the three main colors that are found. So the earth and I chose a green color, the sky, I chose blue, and then lastly, the sun. Um, I use a yellow. Green is a dominant color found in nature and it reminds us of growth, abundance, and refreshment. And it's often used in offices to put a patient's ease at mind. The color promotes um, calmness and serenity. It's a non-threatening color and it often lowers the pulse rate and body temperature of individuals. And lastly, yellow, it's known to be a color of happiness. And this color increases mental activity, increases energy, and it just assists people in having um, a strong mind. From a space planning perspective, the main design of my clinic was to have this vertical axis down the center, which will be dividing the health clinic in a substance abuse, um, wing and a mood disorder wing. Um, I'm sure you're aware that those are very different types of mental health issues and having a range of two to 18 year olds in the same building can get a bit tricky. So in addition to splitting the building in half, I've also split it into quarters. So um, each quarter will be uh, a specific age unit and mental disorder. Um, this central hallway that you see in the center is designed to be an immersive experience and also sort of like a self-guided therapy for people of all ages. When patients are not in therapy, they'll be offered headphones to experience this space. Um, along the walls, there will be tactile art where people can interact and touch the wall and feel the wall and all while listening um, to music. And while walking through the space, um, you'll see a gradient of color. This is the three colors that I use that are found in nature. So when you're standing 
the front of the building. And you'll see um, the color yellow, which is kind of my idea of the light at the end of the tunnel. And this is kind of like the hope that patients can have and the motivation that they can have to keep moving forward and not to get stuck in their um, mental illness. The idea behind gradients is to promote movement and direction through color and through form. So there's a consistent prog progression between these three colors throughout the whole space. Um, and this is just like, as I said, the metaphor that we want um, our patients to have. Um, one of the acoustical and um, decorative elements that I have is the baffles in the central hallway. Um, so not only are they introducing my gradient aspect and help with sound, it's also um, a light source. So um, there's a designated baffle that will have down lights or also um, directional lights that accent the um, tactile art on the wall. As far as lighting in my space, I kept it pretty simple and went with a grid throughout um, each room. And you'll see that in some of the waiting areas in patient interactive spaces, there'll be clusters of these baffles that I had down the center hallway. And lastly, here's just some detailed shots of the therapy rooms, um, large group therapy and like small lounge. Um, in this music space, I want people to feel comfortable and I feel like children and young teens um, can have their own way of, you know, laying or leaning, um, sitting. They can just take their body and form it into the curves of this natural and organic shaped furniture. And the outdoor space is a little bit of a continuation with this gradient. Um, it just um, shows organic shaped uh, furniture. And I think that is about it for my project. So I'll hand it over to Melina. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nanina Minas, and I'm going to present uh, the Bright Canyon, um, which is the same uh, clinic. Uh, so during the past year, coronavirus pandemic has impacted children and young people's behavioral condition, including depression, stress, and anxiety, leading to more severe health conditions such as self-harm and addiction. The leading cause associated with an increased risk of mental health problem is loneliness. The Bright Canyon Health Clinic is designed with a central concept of connection and eliminating isolation. We achieve this concept by providing well-designed spaces that are hopeful and functional and have both emotional and physical experiences for all the age group, patients, and workers. The main inspiration for the design is an anxiety toy called the Infinite Cube. Uh, there is a relationship between the idea of connection and this anxiety toy. It can turn into different shapes and forms and allow the person to be creatively focused. To bring the exact identification into the space, we created a sense of connection between the patients in our therapy rooms. These rooms can operate as individual spaces but like the toy with different combinations, our rooms can also open and function as one ample connected space. We decided that there must be one unifying wall that ties all these rooms together and provides a backdrop when it's one big space. So we wanted to feature this connecting wall. The texture wall is made of very authentic material because it is a significant wall since it connects all the therapy rooms and ties everything together. To get the idea of grounded and physical connection, we chose limestone as our wall texture. Uh, it is the te same texture as caves uh, and canyon walls. Uh, we all came from caves and touching these materials can give the feeling of being grounded. Uh, so 
for my material and finishes, uh, I chose a sustainable material such as terrazzo flooring, limestone, bamboo fabric, and rubble tiles. Uh, and the color palette is uh, more of natural colors. Uh, I have different shades of green and beige colors. Uh, and we were supposed to use 50% of uh, Carolina and OFS company's furniture for our design. So these are some of the uh, furniture for my um, clinician areas. Uh, and the lighting fixtures, these are some of my uh, decorative lightings uh, for the therapy rooms. Uh, moving on to my uh, floor plan. So architecturally, the space is divided into two uh, different sites, uh, caregiver space and patient space. Uh, also, I divided patient space into two different uh, age groups. Uh, so I have uh, uh, clay therapy, uh, physical therapy, communication therapy, and horticultural therapy for both uh, age groups from 2 to 12 and 13 to 18. Uh, so as you enter, you can see the waiting area and reception desk, which is also made of the same uh, limestone material as the canyon walls. Uh, and it continues uh, to the hallway to give the same a feeling of connection. Uh, um, next to the uh, therapy rooms, uh, I have my manager offices, the clinician workroom, administrative workroom, uh, and on the left corner, I have office consult, all, all patient clinical workroom, research consult room, exam room, and vital. And I also have a zinc garden, uh, which is for patients and the clinicians. Uh, so this one is going to be my uh, reflected ceiling plan. So I use the ambient lighting for the uh, whole space and I have linear lighting throughout the canyon wall uh, and accent lighting which lights up the canyon wall from in inside. Uh, and I also have the creative lighting uh, for my uh, entrance uh, and um, therapy rooms. Uh, these are two of my sections. Uh, so first one is showing physical therapy, horticultural therapy for uh, patients ages 2 to 12, and horticultural therapy, communication room, and clay workshop for uh, patients 13 to 18. And the bottom one is showing clinical workroom, staff break room, manager's office, and physical therapy and clay workroom for young adults. Uh, moving on to my renderings. So first one, uh, this is the clay workshop and, and the communication room. Uh, as you can see, this sliding doors opened up uh, and two uh, spaces, they got together and it's, um, it make one uh, open space. Uh, the second one is a physical therapy room. I have this cone shape uh, climbing rope. Uh, and also the uh, hanging chairs for kids uh, from ages two to 12 uh, to uh, climb and uh, sit on the, uh, those hanging chairs. Uh, and I have the waiting area and reception desk. So as you can see, I have uh, organic uh, windows throughout the cave wall, um, which makes the setting more open and accessible. Uh, and the last one is my uh, staff uh, break room. Uh, help you out. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, both of you. That was a very interesting concept just for the prompt of it and then two great projects with it. Um, if we could do the same thing of people putting your questions into the chat box, we'll go through that. Um, just while we wait for that, I, I find it interesting you know, not to compare your projects, like they're both great, but just looking at them, how you guys took similar uh, concepts for those natural elements and just seeing how you guys interpreted those differently is really interesting. Uh, Katie, with yours being the organic shapes and having the, the walls and the furniture all be organic. And then Alina, it seemed that yours was more with the floor plan and that your walls were all vertical. So it's, just, it's interesting seeing that contrast between them. Um, I was wondering, both of you guys had divisions in your plan for different uses, uh, whether it be ages or clinics or staff. Do you have any areas that could flex between uses? Um. 
I think the so there are some rooms that are both for patients and clinician work rooms, which is office consult, outpatient work rooms. Uh, those are the areas in my project and also Zen Garden that can be used both with uh, with patients and uh, clinicians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say the same as well. And um, all, all four of the therapy rooms can be interchanged for like each mental illness. It was more so just the fact that um, those patients were having to continuously cross paths and yeah, with the younger and older kids. Great. This Does anybody is else? G. Oh, this is G. I, I just wanted to say welcome to Woodbury. Um, I think the past couple of years we've had Cal Poly Pomona and USC, and it's really great to see what, what your school is doing, what your students are producing, even though you're not necessarily a healthcare specific program. So, and I, I really like, you know, along those veins, the, the different alternative um, care methods that you explored, um, the exploration into music and poetry. I, I loved all of that and how you integrated it into the interior. So. Welcome again and great job to both of the students. And thank you to Gia for prompting us to, to partner with Woodbury this year. Mm -hmm. I'm spreading it. Yeah, and thanks so much to having interior architecture students as well. Like, I mean, I think we often can get really focused on the outside and it's really fun to get to focus on the inside because a lot of us know right. that it ends up being a big chunk of what of what we do in the in the post-school world. So um, lovely projects from both of you. It's really cool to hear about um, behavioral health being discussed in school on this type of level. Does anybody else have questions for these two projects before we open it up to everything else? Oh, William. Uh, yeah, now I have to ask, you know, what, what did the composition sound like? I mean, what, what was it, what element did you take from the composition? Uh, that uh, you William, I, I can put it in the chat for you, actually. I, oh, okay, I can great. post it in the chat if you guys want, want to listen. And it was really interesting because there were, um, you know, the, the different interpretations of that music right at the beginning of the semester were an indication of how different the projects might end up being. You know, the students had quite different reactions to this to this music. So I'll definitely post it in the chat and you can see how you're response will be. I was curious on that too. All right, last chance for any questions. Okay, uh, so we're gonna open it up. I know that we're over our time, but if anybody uh, wants to stay around, um, Final questions for any of the presenters today, anything you didn't get a chance to ask, and then we're also going to open it up to our professors if you have questions, not so much about the projects, but about the, the universities, about the programs, and about the classes. Uh, uh, this is Ernest. Um... I had a thought as you guys are all going through this, uh, you know, I was wondering if there was any idea or thought that the universities, the schools, the, the, you know, the professors that lead these classes might think about a, a, a semester where they would have the same um, problem for the students, you know, the same program, and uh, uh, you know, and, and then be, you know, obviously do their independent, uh, you know, versions of going through their process. But then at the end of the year, sharing, like we just did now, but sharing across a the same program. That would, I, I wonder if any, if, if you know. I wonder if any, any of the professors on board here tonight would have any interest in, in, uh, in, in thinking about that. It, it, it's so fascinating seeing all the, all the great work done by the different schools, but yeah. uh, it, it would, it would, that cross-pollination might be just amazing. Well, anyway, I'll throw that out there, <laughs> not, since I'm not a professor at the schools. <laughs> right. But I just might mention um, that we... we um, 
uh, shared uh, not only our program, but, but also reviewing uh, opportunities with Clemson and also with the University of Toronto, um, uh, where um, Stephen Vertiber is uh, teaching as well. And so the opportunity for us is really to try and connect with, with what we think is the, the best people in the country that are doing this work in, in various ways. And, and I, I really think it's more important for everyone to time, kind of explore ideas that they think are particularly useful and worthwhile, especially programs that have the opportunity to um, attract really um, great students and to examine some of the changes that are taking place in healthcare because there's a great deal of uh, change and adjustment. There are a lot of things that are occurring that, uh, that really uh, could, I think, benefit um, uh, from a, a much broader uh, look at, um, at the problem, as it were. In our case, we, we wanted to look at uh, older people. Two-thirds of um, customers, patients in hospitals or people over the age of 65. Um, we, we have a system that doesn't work very well for uh, people who have chronic illness. And so the idea of having an outpatient clinic, which is open to all ages and all groups, but at the same time um, clearly benefiting people who um, are, are likely to be there more frequently because of their, of their chronic uh, problems, just sort of made sense to us. And there are, and we're kind of behind <laughs> uh, in our culture uh, in thinking about non-institutional alternatives for very old, frail people, people in the age range of 82 to 87. And so that's something that I've been interested and committed to, but also it's a, you know, it's a fight that's worth fighting and one that's worth exploring. Um, so anyhow, uh, sounds like a good idea, but uh, it's not just a, these studios. And I can tell you the ones that are at Texas and, and other places as well. Kansas has a really good um, uh, focus on, um, on looking at, at health care um, as a community resource as well. That's been the kind of uh, focus of, of the last three years of their health care um, examination in their main health care studio. So everyone is looking for ways to kind of figure it out um, and, and add to uh, the conversation and the dialogue. And, and most people are trying to do it with, uh, uh, with an eye on research and what we are learning about um, of these settings and how it can be directly implemented into uh, um, into design uh, examples. It's a fascinating idea to um, to consider this as a kind of a universal problem and look at it from the different perspectives. The studio that Laura teaches is actually a wellness studio, right? So we're not we're looking at healthcare, but not from a disease perspective, but from from an experiential human wellness perspective, and you know that's that's sort of an entirely you know sort of the not the way that the you know the the healthcare system works in this country, right? And and perhaps um, these kinds of explana explorations could change the conversation in that regard, and how we approach um, solutions through design. Um, so to Ernest's point, I think it would be an amazing. Uh, experience to have, let's say, an AIA uh, run competition or even a workshop where all of these programs can uh, maybe come together uh, once or twice uh, in the course of a semester or a project and sort of have an exchange of ideas, right? Have an integrated solution or a cross disciplinary view of how you approach these kinds of difficult problems, social problems. Um, that clearly need uh, better solutions, right? So um, we could really explore this and sort of bring it into the conversation from a policy standpoint, perhaps even looking at different perspectives and approaches to how healthcare can be addressed. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. Uh, if we had five different schools, they were all taking some particular component associated with this uh, uh, this changing um, uh, healthcare uh, building type, um, it would really be, I think, uh, very interesting for everyone because there would be a great, even this, um, this sharing of information um, uh, through, the, uh, through the health uh, 
uh, AIA Healthcare Committee is, I think, a really good move in the direction of saying, what are students thinking about? What are professors thinking about? How are we all looking at it in a slightly different way? And I think we all are interested in how healthcare is changing, and it's all changing to a wellness orientation. That's why we forced our students to think about how uh, the building itself could be connected to the community as well. It made the, it made the actual problem a very difficult one because uh, we were saying, oh, gee, you've got a, a physical therapy center, you've got an educational center, and you've also got uh, um, a place where people can take meals. How can that actually be shared with the community, be shared with the outpatient clinic, and also be shared with the housing as well? Where is it located? How is it connected to the uh, to the surrounding context? Um, how does it work as part of that uh, uh, that collection of uh, land uses? So those are all things that people are trying to do. They're trying to deinstitutionalize hospitals so that people don't think of them as just places to go when you're sick, and they don't shudder every time they walk by. Uh, they think of it as a place that that has um, all kinds of opportunities for, for making life better for people. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well, just on a bit of a smaller scale, but with our with our studio, you know, we're, we're uh, lucky that we're at Woodbury, there's, there's a few different schools. And so we were able, one of the students is actually doing a minor in psychology. So we were able to um, contact her professor, who's actually a, a practicing psychologist who deals with children with these kind of disorders. And she was a really integral part of our class. You know, she was very interested in design, didn't really know much about design, but was very interested in how uh, her perspective and her insights might actually influence and inspire the way we design things. So I think that many of the projects would maybe wouldn't have ended up like they, they have done if it hadn't been for her input. So I think kind of leveraging this interdisciplinary model where you kind of, you know, at Woodbury we have architecture, we have interiors, we have psychology, we have, you know, bringing these different schools together and these different expertises together. Um, can kind of create a much more sort of comprehensive solution, I think, in many ways. So kind of leveraging those, those specialties, I think, is really important. And that also changes the perspective, I think, because I think, in, you know, being in the industry that we're in and the profession that we're in, um, we sort of see the built environment as the point, right, or as the solution. Uh, the built environment in reality is sort of a context or a backdrop, if you will, right? But I think we sort of get lost in, in, in the way that we see architecture as sort of the point um, and, 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 and focus on the building as opposed to what happens inside the building and how it's experienced and what the, uh, the contribution that the building makes to the greater good or the society overall, right? So putting that into perspective by bringing in external um, and leveraging other discipline perspectives and lenses to the problem, I think would really expand sort of the definition of the problem itself and the way we approach it. This is a really great conversation. Uh, definitely things that we'll need to keep in mind when we're planning things in the future. Um, I just wanted to see if there's any last minute questions or comments. Um, thank you again, definitely to the professors for being here, to the students for your amazing presentations today.